Hi, I'm Jan Crayville, and this is where I'm most comfortable, at an organ, playing for church. And here's my next most comfortable spot, playing the piano for church. I've been a church musician since my teens. I've been in paid positions making music at church since my late teens, early 20s. And in that time, I've had to stretch and grow as a musician and as a leader and as a person of faith. And a lot of that stretching and growing has not been particularly comfortable. It wasn't part of my training as an organist or a pianist. I have three degrees in music. One of them is that terminal degree, but I wasn't trained for every style of music that I now am compelled and, and joyful in leading. Songs like this. Maybe you want to sing along with me. I hope that you do. Let's sing Companions on the Journey. It was written in the mid-80s, about the time when I was first having to stretch and grow. And I think the text has a lot to do with what we'll talk about in this workshop. Companions on the Journey. As I said, my training in college and elsewhere did not lead me to be able to do what I just did. A, to sing and play at the same time. B, to play notes that aren't on the page, to play rhythms that aren't on the page, to be informed as to how this piece would sound if it was played by a band or by acoustical guitar. Uh, with people with microphones, all of those things were outside of my training and I had to learn how to do them. And I was fortunate in my church positions to be surrounded with people who were good at doing it and so I could watch and learn. And here is my least comfortable place to be when I'm in a position of leading congregational singing. It's just me vulnerable, imperfect me, without a keyboard instrument to mask my vocal failings, having to look in the eye the people that I'm making music with, having to have my foibles exposed to everyone. It's a, an uncomfortable place to be, but I have learned on my journey that it's also a place of great joy. 
So this workshop is entitled Companions on the Journey, an Organist's Journey from Consul to Congregation. Most organist training doesn't include teaching and leading music in person in front of a congregation. But today's congregational song is full of riches from all sorts of different cultures and not all of it is appropriate to be sung with the instruments that I am most comfortable with. So it's my job as a church musician to find skills that I can lend to those situations. I'm very aware that I'm recording this during a time of COVID isolation, and my teaching style is not this. It is not a lecture style. My teaching style is much more collaborative, and I often prepare far too much for a 45-minute workshop, and my hope is that the participants will start to respond and ask questions, and I can see by the light in their eyes if what I'm saying makes sense. And if not, I change directions. I have enough prepared that I can do that. So this is a very uncomfortable situation too. And honestly, I never thought that I would ever be singing for a video. And so this period of COVID isolation has forced me to gain new skill sets as well. I initially thought about turning down the opportunity of uh, teaching this on a video format. But I decided that if I was going to remain true to my message, which was companions on the journey, we keep taking steps together, that I should take this step. So I'm glad that you've joined me today. Again, the inspiration for this workshop was that text that we just sang. We are companions on the journey, breaking bread and sharing life. And in the love we bear is the hope we share for we believe in the love of our God. No longer strangers to each other, no longer strangers in God's house. We are fed and we are nourished by the strength of those who care. We have been gifted with each other and we are called by the word of the Lord to act with justice, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with our God. We are companions on the journey, breaking bread and sharing life. And in the love we bear is the hope we share, for we believe in the love of our God. My musical journey depended upon companions, and I found a lot of them in the hymn society. My initial role, like I described, was as church organist and sometimes pianist, and sometimes alto in the church choir if it was an a cappella anthem and they needed some more altos. I'm a good choir singer. I am not a solo singer. But I'm now comfortable as a song enlivener without benefit of my keyboard instruments or any other instruments. And I just wanted to share some of that journey with you, not in a self-centered way, but in hopes that perhaps I'll be a companion to you on your journey, and together we'll learn some new skill sets. Along the way, I've been helped by master song enliveners in the hymn society, and I hesitate to name any of them because I'll leave somebody out. But the ones that come to mind initially are Michael Hahn and Mary Oyer and Alice Parker and Paul Vasil and John Bell. These people have taught me through their example what it is to be an effective song enlivener in front of a congregation. And the reward has been amazing. I was initially reluctant to enter into this realm, but as a result, I've discovered new aspects of my own voice, but most importantly, I've discovered the real voice of my congregations. That voice was masked before by my intent to lead them well, but the sound of my instrument surrounding me kept me from hearing their true voice. And now that I know their voice, when I go back to my instrument, 
then I'm able to lead them more effectively. I want to say that none of what I'm about to share with you is new. It's from all of those master enliveners that I have learned from. So I will not take credit for any of it, but I just wanted to share it with you today. So let's sing. This piece is from Zimbabwe. It's a piece that I'm very comfortable leading now as a call to worship, as a welcome, and I invite you to sing with me. It goes like this. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Now if I'm in front of a congregation, I'm going to do it like this. I'll sing a phrase, then you sing it back to me. My turn first. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Repeat. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. My turn. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Now because I have taught this piece a lot, I know that there's, there are people in the congregation that won't realize that there's a difference between the first phrase and the second phrase. One small difference, it's the final note. So I'll make some joke, and then I'll say, you can watch my hands, because my hands are gonna do something different, and that'll help you remember. I'm just treating them the way that I needed to be treated when I first learned this piece. I am a visual learner, and so if I saw it on paper, I'd never miss it, but hearing it is a whole different thing. So I try to help my congregations hear more effectively. So I'll say to them, here's the first phrase again. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Sing for me. Come all you people, come. Now watch my hand. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Second phrase, sing with me. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. See what I did with my hand to help you remember? The great thing is, the third phrase is just like the first phrase. Let's sing it together, here's our pitch. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Oops, some of you went up, I didn't do that, did I? Let's sing it again. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Good job. The last phrase is the hardest of all. I'll sing it for you, then you sing it back. Come now and worship the Lord. Ready? Come now and worship the Lord. Now let's do it two phrases at a time. I'll sing two to you, you'll sing two back to me. My turn. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Are you ready? Here we go. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Great job. Here's the last two. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Here we go. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Now let's put it all together. And I would do that. I won't take time to do that right now. There are also harmony parts that you can put with this piece. And eventually, when my congregation gets um, comfortable with singing that melody so that they can sing it independently, then I would start singing the alto part and teach that. And then I'd start singing the bass part and teach that. There's a descant that can be added. Sometimes I add that. It all depends on how the congregation responds. This is one of the great things about being with them eye to eye is that I get to see how they're feeling before they even have to tell me, before their voices even have to falter. I can see in their eyes that, oh, they haven't quite remembered that. Oh, that's a little bit weird, okay. And I have learned that humor is the best way to, to help them through that without anybody feeling less than. Sometimes I make a mistake on purpose. Sometimes I make a mistake, not on purpose. But if I do, I point it out. John Bell helped me learn that. When I first started this, I was very aware that I do not have a solo voice. And I attended a workshop by John Bell 
And he said that he didn't either. It was such a gift for me to hear him say that. And what he says with humor is that when he leads people to sing, therefore, because his voice isn't perfect, when he leads people to sing, they want to sing louder to overcome his voice. Well, it's not true at all, but that little joke helped me become more confident when I started leading songs. That song actually isn't in English to begin with, so I usually teach it in English, come all you people, come and praise your maker, come now and worship the Lord, but eventually I might teach it in its native language. And so I'll just do that a little bit with you right now. Repeat after me. Uya imose, uya imose, tina ma te mwari, tina ma te mwari. Now you know that because the English repeated, this other language is likely to repeat too. The other language is called Shona. So you're now learning some new words in a completely foreign tongue to most of you. And again, I am not putting myself out as the example for the perfect way to pronounce any language, including English, but especially any other language. I'll probably get it wrong, and that's not an excuse. Each time I try to become better, and each time I try to get my congregations to become better at singing in a new tongue, in a new style, so that we become more authentic. But I don't think the need for perfection in authenticity is a reason not to try to sing in a foreign style, in a foreign tongue to us. If we restrict ourselves only to what is ours, then I think we cheapen ourselves as musical disciples. And so I try to help my congregations sing in languages that are very unfamiliar to me too. All right, so I will do this again. Uya i mose. The second part is tina mate mwari. So I'll sing one phrase to you, you sing it back. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Sing that with me. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. I'll sing the second phrase. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Remember that? Here we go. Two phrases, first and second. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. What do you remember about the first phrase and the third phrase? They're exactly alike. So now we've got three phrases learned. Let's sing those three phrases together. Here we go. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Uya i mose, tina mate mwari. Stop. And now the final phrase is this. Uya i mose zvino. Can you do that with me? Uya i mose zvino. Now can we do the whole song? And then I would do that with my congregation. So you get the idea. So I've just shown you some basic techniques that I learned very early on and that I've honed and that I've practiced so that I can do this in front of a congregation. One of them, you can tell I talk with my hands a lot. I also gesture with my hands a lot. So this is a relative scale of pitch so that they know if my hand goes up, then it's gonna be a higher pitch. If it goes down, it's gonna be a lower pitch. You saw this, this is the same, this is one pitch up. None of that is standardized at all, except it's standardized within me. So soon my congregation learns that when I do this, for example, it means it's my turn to sing. When I do this, it's their turn to sing. Those other things, they just learn, and I have learned what gestures work the best. You also sometimes observed me singing on pitch the next instruction. So when I want them to start singing, I'll often do this and say, sing with me, here we go. Uya i mose. So I don't have to give the pitch separately from my instruction. Um, I also have the whole thing memorized. 
That was hard for me. I don't memorize easily. As, as I said, I'm a visual learner. I like to have notes in front of me. But it's not effective if I'm asking them to sing something by rote and, and I'm not doing it as well. So I have these things memorized. I sing them in my car. Um, I, I try to always have this repertoire that I'm about to teach them. I try to have it memorized. You also heard me teach it in English first. It's not because I believe English is better, it's just that when I'm trying to teach them new pitches, new melodies, uh, new actions sometimes, it's just easier if I'm not also teaching them a new language. Later on in this workshop, I'll show you some exceptions to that, but for this piece, it's easiest for me to teach English first. But what if you are now saying to me, oh, my congregation would never go for that, it's way too complex, or I as a leader, I could never go for that, it's way too beyond me. Well, here's one that could be even more successful. And this is a prayer. So sometimes if I'm nervous, I actually sing this with my eyes closed. I'm still helping them, their eyes are not closed, but mine are. This is a prayer using another foreign language, but it's one that you are already familiar with because we use it in church all the time. The words are Kyrie eleison, and the only one that you have to repeat is Kyrie, because in this piece, you are going to play the part of an instrument. It's an instrument that you probably have never heard of. I have not heard of it before. It's called a berimbau, and it's an instrument that is indigenous to the people of Brazil. Historians think that it actually came from Africa and made its way to Brazil. It's made out of a hunting bow and the echo chamber or the resonant chamber for it, for its tones, is actually the human mouth. So the berimbau player would place one tip of his or her instrument in his or her mouth. The other tip of the bow is here. Of course, a bow has a string on it. That's how you shoot an arrow. So you could go like this with the bow and make the string longer or shorter. A baron bow basically has two pitches, low and high. So if I'm a baron bow player, it sounds something like this. Na -na. Na -na. It would actually be this way, wouldn't it? Na -na. Na, na. You're going to be the barren bow, and all you have to do is follow my hand for low and high, and your only word is Kyrie. So you're going to do this. Kyrie, Kyrie, Kyrie. You can join in anytime you want to. You now know your part. Kyrie, Kyrie. And once I have my congregation so that they're singing with confidence and following my hand, then I usually close my eyes and tell them that I'm going to sing a prayer. Kyrie, Kyrie. You keep that going. Kyrie. I do hope that you were singing with me, because if you just listened to that, you know how imperfect my voice is. But it is a way to get your congregation singing independently of you and listening to the harmony that we all can create together, just with two parts, with their part and your part. It works out very well. Three things were the hardest for me to learn in this role. 
competence, confidence, and authority. So competence for me came through repetition. I just got up in front of my congregation and thank God they were understanding. <laughs> my current congregation is about mm, 70 to 80 people on a Sunday morning with varying um, enthusiasms about music, with very en varying enthusiasms about faith, um, but with love for me and with love for the community so that they will try things with me if I'm vulnerable with them. And so the competence part of it came with practice and repetition. The competence part came with that. The confidence part, that was harder because that's an internal thing. Like I said, I was helped by John Bell, who is vulnerable enough to say that he's not always confident either in his singing voice. And so I just try, and I know I'm not perfect, but I hope in my imperfections lie uh, maybe confidence of someone who's sitting in the second to the last row and is scared to join in. Maybe they'll join because I'm not perfect. And then authority. It turns out that I didn't need it. So I became um, acquainted with, I was always aware of these two women, but I became acquainted with them. In other words, I got to meet them and sing under their leadership. These two women I became acquainted with later in their lives. They are Mary Oyer and Alice Parker, two, as far as I'm concerned, giants of hymn and song enlivening in congregations without benefit of instrument. And I noticed that they could lead with quiet authority. It was something I'd never seen before. So you didn't need to be boisterous and you didn't need to insist with the strength of your voice. You just quietly invite people to sing and they really want to sing. So you give them the tools and they join in. So authority I didn't need, vulnerability is what I needed, an invitational spirit is what I needed. I did not need authority. So that soon fell by the wayside. And I'm still learning, and I'm still not always confident or competent, or not totally vulnerable either. It's always my goal. And what I've found the key is, is that it's not about me. It's about caring enough to help my congregation sing together. It's about caring enough about voices in community. That's what it's about. So that's what's helped me. Let's sing another piece. This is from Cameroon. And this is one that I'm going to teach not in English first because I think that its native French is, is plenty easy to catch on. Louez le Seigneur. That's all you need to know. Well, no, there's another part. But Louis le Seigneur goes like this. Louis le Seigneur, Louis son Seigneur, Alleluia. And if I get looks back from my congregation, the crossed eyes, the dull looks, the, I will never be able to do this, then I take a different tack and I might separate the, the melody and the words. And so I'll say, Louis le Seigneur, say that to me, Louis le Seigneur. Louis son saint nom, Louis son saint nom. Alleluia, alleluia. People perk up, oh, they know that word, and I remind them that's, that's not an English word either. <laughs> so, so we'll stumble through this together, but we, we will sing it together. So, Louis le Seigneur, Louis son saint nom, alleluia. I'll sing to you again, you listen, and see if you can sing back the next time. My turn first. The very last part is actually easier because you already know the words and the melody is easier. Louis 
So I'm going to sing the whole thing to you, and you're going to sing the whole thing back. I'm speeding this up for purposes of this class, and because I think most of you are musicians, and because I doubt you're singing with me, <laughs> because I wouldn't be if I was watching this at my desk, at my computer. So I'm going to just speed this part up. But you know the process that I would go through. All right, here it is. to sing that. Then I start adding parts. And this is the reason that I'm doing this for this workshop. I have to memorize all four parts. So once they know that's the alto part, once they know that part, then I invite some people to continue singing that part. And I add the soprano. go to a piano, or if that isn't available, then I will have pre-taught that part to a bass that can help me with it. And so I call that person up and I say, I have an assistant, and he's going to sing to you that bass part. That's how I get around not being able to sing everything in every octave. Sometimes it's possible to sing something an octave above and your congregation will know to sing an octave lower. But often I've found, and in this piece it is always true, that I can't get the basses to sing low enough um, without someone showing them what that pitch is. So I either go to a piano or I have an assistant that helps me with it. So my congregation is constantly teaching me things. And if they don't immediately teach me something, if I can't see from their eyes that I'm either making sense or not making sense, or we need to review something, or I need to inject a bit of humor, then I will ask for feedback, either before or after. I have trusted people in my congregation. My husband is one of them. <laughs> Often I will ask, did that come across okay? What could I have done differently? I will ask after this class, what have I done well in front of a video? How can I improve? because this is the very first time that I've done this. Feedback is always helpful. Whether it's positive or negative, it is always, always helpful. So I'm always observing what works. I'm always trying to keep my creativity going so that if the tricks that have worked in other situations don't work here, then I'm trying to constantly be able to be creative. The way I do that is to overlearn, to have things so solidly in my memory that I can listen while I'm teaching. That takes a lot of preparation, but your, your congregations appreciate it very, very much. And then I learned from people like um, Paul Basile and uh, Michael Hahn and John Bell, I learned about storytelling because it makes people fall in love with a thing before you even start teaching it to them. If you can tell them where it came from, why it's relevant to them. Never make excuses though. Never say, well, this is gonna be kind of hard, but because it's World Communion Sunday, I feel like we should sing in another language. It, that doesn't help at all. But if you can say things like, this comes from Brazil, and they had a barambao, a bow, isn't that so cool? I just couldn't believe, and I saw one um, actually at a concert once, so I know this thing exists, I'm not making it up. <laughs> um, tell them about the instrument, tell them something about the people that created this piece, and don't forget to do that for hymns that they know and love. So, for instance, in this time of COVID isolation, the story behind what a friend we have in Jesus could be very helpful to somebody, could be very helpful to you. What a friend we have in Jesus is not my most favorite hymn, and it's because of a musical reason. I, I just don't like the hymn tune converse. Um, it just seems difficult for a congregation to sing in a beautiful way. 
But I know the story behind the poetry, and I know that it was written at a time of separation of a son from his mother. And the son wrote his mother this comforting hymn, this comforting poem. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Uh, if you don't know the whole story behind that hymn, I highly encourage you to look it up. And I highly encourage you to do that for everything that you share with your congregation. Whether you can share that story in the context of worship or not. Share it in Sunday school, share it at coffee hour. Of course, I'm pining for all these things to return in our COVID-defined world right now. But there are lots of ways that aren't in formal worship that you can share those hymn stories. I often say to congregations that every hymn is first a poem that was written by a person for a significant reason in their life. Therefore, every hymn is somebody's testimony. And so we need to sing those testimonies with care, even if they aren't reflecting our current journey or our current beliefs, even if not, we need to know that at that point in that person's life, it was an outpouring of faith and we need to sing them that way. So I've had lots of proud moments and they have nothing to do with me. Proud moments when my congregation did this well. They overcame my deficiencies and they heard their voice singing a cappella, sometimes in multiple parts, sometimes in different languages, and they realized that they could do it. I love being face to face with my congregation for those moments because I see the light come on in their, in their eyes and I see them internalize this piece that we've all learned together. Sometimes now I can, at the organ, let them have a stanza. Organists, when we do that, we have to do it, we have to lead them to it carefully. Don't just drop out. So what I usually do is, as we're leading up to the stanza that I want to be a cappella, I take the right hand melody out, keeping everything else in and listening carefully. And if they're doing that well, if they're still sticking to the melody, then often I will take the tenor part out next because I've learned that somehow they falter less if the soprano and tenor are missing rather than the soprano and alto. The alto part is the part I take out next if they're doing everything else well. And finally, the bass notes my feet are the thing I take out last so that that foundation remains until the very end. I'm removing stops as we go so the organ is getting softer but I'm listening to make sure they're still singing with confidence and if they are then I give it over to them and often they don't realize I've done that until they're in the middle of the acapella stanza and it's wonderful to hear their voices and watch their faces as they realize that they have total control, that it is their stanza. They get to decide on the tempo, they get to decide how long the breaths are, and they love it. I love those moments. And then a huge proud moment for me was when my congregation took on the challenge of a cappella Sunday. If you don't know about Acapella Sunday, it is a hymn society thing, and it happens now all over the world. You can join with your congregation if you'd like. It's always the first Sunday of Lent. And on that Sunday, the musical leaders of my congregation and our pastor decided that we could do this, and the entire Sunday was Acapella. So not a single instrument was in our service. And for our congregation, that sang a lot. I know in some traditions, that is just normal. In our tradition, it's not. So the prelude was a cappella, all of the hymns, all of the songs, all of the responses, everything was a cappella. The postlude was a cappella. The offertory music was a cappella. 
everything was sung, every musical part of the service was sung by the congregation a cappella. I was so proud when they took on that challenge and they followed us through and, and they liked it to their surprise, actually to my surprise, they liked it. So I encourage you to take on this, this role. As a benediction, I would like for us to sing a new, newer text to Talus Canon. If you don't know that melody, or maybe the, the title of it doesn't ring any bells, it goes like this. Da, 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 da. published in 1561 and the text that we'll sing to it was published in the mid-1980s again going back to when I was a young church musician just like when we sang Companions on the Journey. It's not that I didn't know how to lead this style, I knew how to lead it from the organ but there's a whole different skill set to leading a canon when you're in front of the congregation and you're the only person in front of the congregation leading that canon. And through lots of repetition, I've learned that skill set. But I want to show you how to do that with this text by Jane Parker Huber, because I think it speaks to our times right now, these times when we don't know when we're going to be able to come back to congregational singing. So that's why I've chosen this text. It goes like this. The peace of mind that Christ can bring is peace in knowing how to sing in spite of doubts of why or how, in spite of fears of here and now. Her text goes on for three more stanzas. But I want to be able to, I hope, display this on the screen as I'm leading it. So we're just going to do the first stanza in canon. So we'll start by singing it in unison. Then we'll do it in a two-part canon. And I'm just going to motion this way and this way as if you are a class or a congregation. Then we'll do it in a four-part canon. But notice what I do, because as a leader, you have to actually have kind of an organist brain where we have left hand, right hand, feet all doing different things. You have to be aware of what the four different parts of your congregation are doing in a canon in order to lead it well. Here we go. The peace of mind that Christ can bring is peace in knowing how to sing in spite of doubts of why or how in spite of fears of here and now. Now in two-part canon, here we go. The peace of mind that Christ can bring, the peace of mind that Christ can bring, in spite of doubts of why or how, in spite of Journey as I was, and if so, great. 
Maybe you disagree with some of the things that I have found to be effective in front of my congregation. That's great too. Every congregation is different. Every musician is different. But I hope that you've found something that you can add to your toolkit of skills that help your congregation to sing more confidently when you're in front of them without benefit of a keyboard instrument. So I've been thinking about next steps on our journeys. And of course, in this time of COVID confusion, we don't really know what the next step on our journey of congregational song is. So it is a time to think, it is a time to prepare, it's a time to mourn even the loss of congregational song. But it's also a time to joyously anticipate what it will be like when we get back together. So here are some suggested next steps. Don't do all of them. I'm not going to do all of them. But just a few suggestions for what could be your next step on the journey. One is, congratulations for attending this conference online. So check out other videos. That can be an important next step. And I don't know the content of those videos, so I can't wait to check them out as well. Listen and observe and learn. There are experts all around us, even in this period of COVID isolation. So in conferences like this, but also we have technology that can put us in touch with experts in almost any field. So check out YouTube, check out webinars, check out Zoom meetings. There are all sorts of ways to find the next step, the next better person to emulate along your journey. I'll put some of those in the handout for this workshop, so be sure and check those out. Eventually, we'll be able to gather again in person, and so then I highly encourage you to attend classes, because there's nothing like singing together while a master is leading us. Use this time of COVID isolation to practice your craft, to get your skills sharper, there is great blessing in having a little bit of extra time without the press of every Sunday, every new anthem, every new lesson. Um, some of us have the benefit now of taking a step back. And yes, it is a time of mourning and it's a time of loss. I do feel that, but it's also an opportunity to hone our craft so that when we do get back together, we're that much better. Build on the skills that COVID has forced you to learn. So for me, those are technological skills. Mine were sadly lacking, even though I actually, at a former point in my life, I was an IT person. I was at the help desk, but uh, I, those skills had fallen by the wayside. And so I'm learning now about technology and how it can help us. I'm learning about video editing. All of these skills will help you in the next part of your journey. When COVID's over, we can look back at this time and say, oh yeah, I got those skills because of COVID. And then let's do meet at the next conference of the Hymn Society. Let's have the benefit of sharing ideas together around a meal or in a hymn festival. In formal ways and informal ways, that's what Hymn Society conferences are all about. And I can't wait till we can get back together again and sing. In the meantime, keep singing, even if it's by yourself in front of a computer screen. Keep safe. Be well. Keep making music. Thanks for listening.